welcome to this live Action for Happiness event. Uh, it's great to see you all joining us, uh, hundreds, in fact, thousands of people from all around the world, part of this community who are trying to create a happier and kinder world together. And I'm really pleased you joined us for today's event with Professor James Doty on the subject of power of your mind. Jim, it's lovely to have you with us. Thank you so much for making time for this. Well, thank you for having me, uh, Mark. You're a hero of mine, and uh, I follow what uh, goes on with Action for Happiness. So uh, congratulations on developing such a um, really a powerful network that is so inspiring to so many people. Thank you, Jim. I really appreciate you saying that. And to, to the many hundreds of you coming back and who are regular members of this community, thank you again for, for being here and for all that you do to help others around you. Compassion and caring for the happiness of others will definitely be a theme that comes up in our conversation today. And if you're new to this, again, a very warm welcome. This is a group of people guided by a desire to create a happier and kinder world. Of course, that's to do with our own lives and how we look after our own well-being. But crucially, it's all about what we want to see in the world around us, how we treat each other and what we look for in wider society. And I couldn't think of a better topic and a better um, expert to have with us today to talk about this. So Jim and I will have a conversation for the first 30 or 40 minutes, but we'll have some interactive opportunities for you to get involved and listen to you in the audience as well. And then there'll be your chance to put questions to Jim. So please do use the Q&A function and we'll get to at least some of those um, insights and questions later in the conversation. But first of all, Jim, I'd love to invite you to share a bit more about your own journey. Obviously, you're a, an expert, a neuroscientist, and you've worked in this field for many, many years, founder of a fantastic institution, Seacare, and we could maybe talk a bit more about that. But I'm particularly interested in your own journey. You've written a, already one brilliant book, which shared a bit of insights into the journey you've been on. And I know you've got another great book uh, to do with this theme of the power of the mind coming out later this year. Maybe you could give us a little thumbnail sketch of that journey. Uh, sure. Uh, obviously, every one of us uh, has a past. And uh, for most of us, that past affects our future. And in fact, what many people don't appreciate is uh, oftentimes the baggage we carry from our past impacts every facet of our lives, whether it's uh, a partner, interaction with others, the jobs we take. And uh, my past uh, for me was uh, somewhat traumatic. Uh, I uh, My father was an alcoholic. My mother had had a stroke when I was a child and was partially paralyzed, had a seizure disorder, uh, unfortunately chronically depressed, attempted suicide. We were evicted uh, from a variety of residences. And as you can imagine, that is not the best uh, way to create an environment of human thriving. And it wasn't so much because my parents didn't care. It's just that they were preoccupied with their own issues and did not have effective tools to deal with them. And as a result, I uh, often felt alone, even though I had a brother and a sister, and I felt uh, filled with despair uh, and a sense of hopelessness. And uh, as you can imagine, if you don't have mentors, if you don't have uh, uh, adequate uh, financial resources uh, or exposure to opportunities, it's really uh, hard to move forward in life. And uh, there's a whole field of research called uh, adverse childhood experiences. And if you look at children in situations where there's violence, uh, different types of abuse, poverty, uh, mental health disorders, the likelihood for them uh, succeeding in life actually uh, uh, is quite low. Yeah, indeed. Well, thank you for, for sharing that. Um... I'm a little bit torn as to whether we talk about your original book about um, entering the magic shop or whether we look ahead to your upcoming book, because both have such a lot of richness within them and sort of linked to what you've just said. But I, I was struck particularly by the sentiment of the opening statement of a, of a preview of your new book, um, which I, I um, was kind of, I guess, maybe intended to shock, but basically saying the universe doesn't give an F about you. Um, why, 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 what, why, what in your journey has led you to that? And why is that potentially a really hopeful way of looking at how we live our lives, Jim? Sure. Well, 
to sort of go back to uh, what I was saying, this child who was 12 at the time, filled with hopelessness and despair, what changed the trajectory of my life was actually uh, meeting a woman in a magic shop. That's the title of my book, Into the Magic Shop. But to answer your question more specifically, one of the things that this woman taught me uh, really, uh, in some ways, was the origin of that sentence. You were kind enough to not say the F word, uh, but the, <laughs> the sentence is, uh, the universe doesn't give a fuck about you. And it's not uh, uh, in any way to be profane necessarily, but it's to grab your attention and make you understand that so many people uh, keep waiting uh, for something to happen outside of themselves. And this is this idea of manifestation. And uh, as you well know, there's a book called The Secret, uh, which sold a large number of copies, and this idea of the law of attraction. And uh, of course, this is pseudoscience and woo-woo or nonsense. Um, there is no law of attraction. There is nobody out there to help you, at least in the universe. And in fact, I was talking to my friend, John Hamm, the actor, and he said to me, he said, at best, the universe is indifferent. And uh, the point is that, unfortunately, we have been led to believe that if we uh, do different practices, wish for, pray for, uh, write things down, that there will be some uh, magical universal law that will get us what we want. And it's just not true. Now, this is not to dispel uh, the idea that uh, manifesting itself is nonsense, but there are a couple of things I think you have to address first. One of those is the notion that <clears throat> we've been told in modern society that happiness translates into being successful with success being defined by, unfortunately, our Western capitalist narrative, that that means money, position, and power. And so if you have those, you're going to be happy. The other aspect of this is, uh, again, going back to the universe, uh, that something outside yourself will give you what you need to make these things happen. And what, unfortunately, people don't appreciate is that the power to make things happen is not outside of themselves. It's not a wishing for uh, something in the universe to give. The reality is the power is within yourself. And so many people, when they keep looking for affirmation or they keep looking for something outside themselves, oftentimes they're giving their self-agency away, which actually in some ways, takes away their power and diminishes their own ability to change their lives. And so I think one of the most important things that I want to emphasize is that within ourselves is really unlimited power. And when we realize that and take advantage of that, everything changes. Mm. Well, I, <clears throat> this is very much in line with the ethos of action for happiness that our actions make a difference and not just for ourselves but for others as well and i i really like you reminding us of the fact we're in a system which almost encourages us to pursue the wrong uh paths towards living a, a good life i'm reminded of a quote uh money doesn't make you happy but everybody wants to find out for themselves that we're all sort of hell-bent on rediscovering the fact that actually what makes life good isn't about these external validations but I'd love to turn at this point Jim as we sometimes do in these events to the audience to get their wisdom and to just listen to each other for a moment so if folks uh, these things that Jim has mentioned you know um, money and power and status and wealth or whatever if these aren't really the um, the secrets to, to happiness what do you think some of the, the true sources of a happy and meaningful life are if you'd like to just take a few words in the chat and share you know perhaps a, a slightly more um effective uh, pursuits for happiness. We'd love to hear what's on your mind. So I'll, I'll read a few of these out to you and we can reflect on them too. Inner peace, love, family, connections, uh, volunteering, purpose, self-acceptance, communion, friendship, respect, fulfillment, nature, 
being, setting challenges, vulnerability, yoga, empathy, contentment, sacred space, creativity, being present, calm, human connection, kindness, fulfilling your potential, uh, and and so many more uh, that I, I can't even keep up with it. But I'm finding that a really um, uplifting list of attributes. How do you feel as you see that list, Jim? No, I think uh, that's exactly right. It, it's unfortunate, though, that so many people uh, have to go through that journey. And I think the other sad part is that so much energy is expended trying to, quote unquote, be successful, that uh, uh, it causes so much grief and as you know, uh, attachment to outcomes, i.e. being quote unquote successful, um, uh, actually at the end of the day, isn't fulfilling and actually causes suffering. And in some ways this gets back to a very interesting point, which is the key is really the journey that you're on and who you're on that journey with. That is where the real, if you will, gold of uh, these types of uh, activities are. Yes, it's great to achieve a goal, but at the same time, so many people are no longer in the present because they're so focused on the goal oftentimes. Mm. So let's come to this uh, word that you refer to of manifesting. I mean, you've obviously talked about the fact there was some sort of wishful thinking ways of manifesting that are quite popular in in certain literature, probably because it gives people a sense of hope. And of course, hope is a helpful attribute. But we want hope that channels us to do things rather than wish for things, if you like. And so I wondered, I, I know your upcoming book's going to be about how we do have it, the, a power within our minds to take control, to feel that sense of autonomy. What do you mean when you talk about manifesting and, and, and how that can be a, a realistic, evidence-based, positive thing rather than just wishful thinking? Well, I think I just have to back up for a second because we mentioned the book, The Secret. We mentioned this idea of the law of attraction. And if you really look closely at those books, the primary narrative is I want. I want money. I want power. I want position. And the challenge is that this wanting is based on a false narrative. And it actually diminishes your power. If you look at how we evolved as a species, of course, we started with the nuclear family, uh, which is responding to the needs of our offspring. And then this evolved to, if you will, um, tribal interactions, or uh, if you will, the start of society in some ways. But it was all related to being of service to others. And there's a great deal of evidence that demonstrates that when you're kind, when you care, when you're compassionate, this has an extraordinarily positive impact on not only your mental state, but also physiologically. And uh, so when the focus is always on you, uh, it actually diminishes your ability to manifest. And the first sentence of the book, which we mentioned, actually uh, relates to this in the sense that <clears throat> when you focus on yourself, in some ways, it's about you saying, I want the universe to help me. But the reality is people uh, need to understand the difference between what they think they want and what they actually need. And what people actually need is to have purpose and meaning in their lives. Purpose and meaning, and ultimately a deep sense of happiness, don't come from driving a Ferrari or uh, living in a big mansion. Now, I will tell you, I've had the privilege, if you want to call it a privilege, to be uh, being highly successful and essentially having everything I could possibly want. And at the pinnacle of that want, I was uh, never more unhappy in my entire life. 
And it was interesting. You made a quote about uh, how others want to be like you. Uh, and in fact, paraphrasing, uh, uh, getting what you want. And I had all of my friends saying, wow, it must be amazing. You have a Ferrari, a Porsche, a Mercedes. It must be amazing. You live in a penthouse. It must be amazing. You're in a private jet. And it wasn't amazing because <clears throat> what people forget is all of us have an emptiness inside of ourselves. And that can only be filled by being of service to others, by caring for others. It is only transiently filled by these uh, self-indulgent behaviors. And that is a very, very short-lived feeling. And that's why we see so many people trying to say, okay, I have this. Oh, well, that didn't work. Now I have this. That didn't work. The thing that gives meaning and purpose and a deep sense of happiness is to be of service and to care for others. Mm. And I'm reminded again of a quote, one that you reminded me of when we spoke recently, uh, Jim, from His Holiness, the Dalai Lama, who says, if you want others to be happy, practice compassion. If you want to be happy, practice compassion, because actually there's something reciprocal about this, which is that when we care for others, of course, it helps them. That's our primary intention. But the sort of beautiful aspect of compassion is that that also brings us that sense of meaning and purpose and a, a sort of deeper sense of um, happiness and sort of contentment than we would get when we just do the I want um, sort of approach. So I, I'd love us to talk a bit more about the, the practical ways we can cultivate that. I know that you've spent many years looking at practices like meditation. What, what, what have you found to be some of the effective ways of cultivating this kind of manifesting, manifesting, if you like, for the greater good rather than just for the I want? Sure. Let me, uh, before I speak about that, let me just say that this interaction I had with this woman in the magic shop, mm. which was quite unusual because uh, she actually was the owner's mother and knew nothing about magic. And after her and I spoke for a period of time, she said, I really like you. I'm here for another six weeks. And um, that led to her and I spending quite a bit of time together. And what she taught me was, in fact, a mindfulness or meditation practice. And this was when I was 12 and uh, uh, long, long before this terminology was used uh, and long, long before this concept of neuroplasticity. But she did teach me a manifestation practice. And she did, in fact, emphasize it shouldn't necessarily be about yourself. But as a 12-year-old, I was very naive, of course. And I made a list of things that I wanted. And uh, they were very uh, uh, selfish, uh, a mansion, a million dollars, a Rolex watch, et cetera. And my point is, I achieved every one of those things, but I was miserable. And the point is that at a point in my life where I seemingly had everything, a, a course of events occurred where I lost everything, uh, $80 million in six weeks. I was effectively bankrupt. I had to get rid of all of my various and sundry cars and uh, sell my houses and my villa in Florence. And, uh, uh, and it put me through a deep period of reflection to understand what went wrong. And again, what went wrong was that I was focused on the wrong thing because many of us uh, have a part of ourselves, which I call baggage, which makes us feel that we're not good enough. And I think this is very, very common. And as a result, when we feel this way, we have this false belief that I will feel better if I get affirmation from others. And this is the point of striving uh, for, quote unquote, success. And then at some point, you realize you've climbed all these mountains, you've done all this stuff, and you don't feel any better. And that was the inflection point that changed everything in my life and made me realize that the way in which we evolved as a species obviously very much uh, has affected how our brain networks interact. And that gave me the insights uh, to understand that when one manifests, it must be in service of others. And then 
if you in fact do it that way, one, it greatly increases the uh, ability for that manifestation to occur, but it also allows you to get all the other things you need. And I think that's really the key point uh, in this book. And uh, the book is called Mind Magic, The Neuroscience of Manifestation and How It Changes Everything. Jim, I, I wonder if actually members of this community, Action for Happiness, are to some extent already practicing what you're suggesting here, because actually the, the community has this idea of a pledge, and the pledge says, uh, you know, it's, it's a pledge to create more happiness and less unhappiness in the world. And so rather than it being like a, I want to be happier pledge, it's a, I would like to be a force for good. And in creating more happiness, that will include mine, I hope, but it's actually also about other people. And, and similarly, reducing unhappiness. Yeah, well, I obviously want to avoid that in my own life, but, but particularly through helping others avoid suffering as well. And so I, I feel like that may be an example of the manifestation you're talking about, but maybe you could give us some other examples of how we live this well i think you're absolutely correct i i think there are a couple aspects one has to be careful of uh, some people do activities quote unquote to help others but actually what they're doing is they're performing them to be looked at by others to tell them you're a good guy. So they're doing something to get positive affirmation from mm. others. And there's actually an interesting study that was done among volunteers. And it showed with, uh, and I can't remember the exact number, so I'm paraphrasing, so forgive me. But basically it showed if you did a, a minimum number of volunteer acts per week, that <clears throat> it would have a actually a profound effect on your longevity. And these were people over the age of 65. And in, in fact, it almost increased their longevity almost twofold compared to a controlled group of people. But there were some exceptions. And the exceptions were the people who, one, uh, were actually acting to get that affirmation from others, or uh, <clears throat> they were trying to achieve some outward status, which is in, in many ways similar. And they had absolutely no, uh, uh, it had absolutely no effect on their longevity whatsoever. So it's really important that this desire to be of service to help others comes from an authentic place and not an ego-driven place. Very well said. Thank you for making that so clear. Um, Jim, I'm, I'm conscious of the fact that we've been talking about manifesting for a little while here, but we haven't really defined it. And Nadia in the chat um, was just asking, as a non-native English speaker, could we just explain what you mean when you use that word, regardless of what others may, may think it means? Sure. So manifesting is utilizing the power within you to achieve goals. And it's really uh, that simple. And in fact, every one of us every day is trying to manifest events. I mean, that's our nature as a species. The question is, most of it of us do it very inefficiently. As an example, you may uh, uh, see something that you may want uh, and you go, oh, gosh, I really want that. And you repeat it and you say, gosh, I've been thinking about that. And in some ways, that's a type of manifesting, or it could be in service of others saying, gosh, it's really unfortunate that there are people starving. Uh, it would be great if uh, there was a food bank near me, and I hope that happens. And uh, But there's a difference between sort of casually saying it and actually creating the environment uh, for that to actually occur. And I'll give you really one quick example. Uh, as many of you know about my other book, Into the Magic Shop, this is a story of my own journey. Uh, and a great part of it was actually getting into medical school. And it, it uh, actually was quite extraordinary, the process of how that happened, which in great part had to do with manifesting. 
but I received an email from a young lady from Sri Lanka. Uh, she was an immigrant here. Her parents had left Sri Lanka under challenging circumstances. They were middle class to upper middle class there. When they came to the United States, of course, they found that the roads are not lined with gold. And the father had to take a job driving a taxi. And certainly there's nothing wrong with driving a taxi. Uh, and her mother became a service worker for elderly people. Uh, but they were essentially in poverty. And her parents wanted her to become a doctor. And many people in East Asian culture uh, want their children to be engineers or doctors or professionals. And this is what she strived for. But unfortunately, uh, she had applied to medical school multiple times and had failed. And she reached out to me and I spent a bit of time speaking with her. And her focus was, I want this because I need this to make my parents happy. But it was, I need this. And it wasn't uh, emphasis on, I want to be a doctor to be of service. And she had been rejected from medical school three times. And we had a long talk about this concept of manifesting. And she changed how she saw herself and in fact, I think it was an authentic desire to be of service, but she was misdirected because she so wanted her parents to be proud of her. And ultimately, cha she changed how she looked at the world and spent a lot of time through many of the practices that are associated uh, with manifesting. And ultimately, she did get accepted to medical school. And in fact, she recently graduated and is becoming a psychiatrist. And so it's just an example of when you change how you look at the world, that can really have a profound effect on um, your success at manifesting. Yes, that is really interesting and a great example of um, how there's almost more power when we're thinking about how, how am I wishing for this in order to help others rather than how am I wishing for this in order to be validated in some way. I think that's really, really good illustration of that um in a moment i'd love to come on to a sort of related topic of um self-compassion because i sense that a lot of people who are who are practicing a, a genuine intent to help others often are at risk of burnout and perhaps not being able to have the resources to be able to stay able to put that into practice but uh, before we move off the sort of broader compassion manifesting i'd love to ask you jim what, what are some practices you do in your life to to make this happen i mean is it a is it a mindfulness practice is it a sort of intention setting how do you make this part of your daily life well uh again uh much of it comes back to being self-aware the difference between what i want and how can i be of service and i think mm. oftentimes the nature of our egos are such that we have this tendency to keep getting back to i want and this is not to sit there and say, I don't care about myself and therefore I want for everyone else. It doesn't work that way either. But it's the difference between your drive of the ego to be recognized or get affirmation versus focusing on things outside of yourself uh, to... Um, manifest and meaning in service of others. And it's a weird paradox, right? On the one hand, we say, <laughs> look outside yourself and be of service. But the other aspect is you have to change how you uh, think about things and how you perceive things. Uh, so it's an interesting combination. And one of the other aspects is that one has to understand how uh, brain networks work and how you are able to embed your intention in a manner in which it increases uh, the likelihood of, in fact, you manifesting. And I think on that point about brain networks, I was fascinated to learn from you that, you know, we have this an amazing amount of information that our senses receive every second. And, you know, it's, it's kind of vital that our, our conscious brain is only able to look at a few of them and our, most of it's taken care of, by, of our subconscious. But I, I, I got the impression from you, maybe I got, tell me if I got this right, that actually 
if we can build some of these intentions or bring our conscious attention to our intentions, we can help sort of wire them in in a slightly more repeatable part of our sort of subconscious. Could you say a bit more about how that sort of balance between the things we're able to consciously focus on and the and the rest of the noise that we're sort of ignoring? How does that work? No, uh, you're exactly right. And uh, obviously, uh, we have five senses. Uh, now, you can argue there are others. But we don't need to go to that debate. But uh, with our senses, we receive uh, approximately 100 million bits of information a second. Wow. But on a conscious level, we're only able to process 50 to 100. And again, most of that information is either for maintaining the he uh, homeostasis of our body functions. Some of it is just completely ignored. Uh, but the reality, though, is that we have these brain networks that interact with each other. And one of those is the attention network. One of those is the salience network. How do you make something salient? How does it get your attention? And then this interacts with our executive control network and our default mode networks. But the point being that there are ways in which you on a conscious level can embed your intention into your brain so that it goes from conscious to subconscious now or unconscious. And again, these terms often are used interchangeably. But the point being that, and I'm sure all of you have experienced, if you're at a party, and even though there's tons of noise, if somebody says your name, it immediately gets your attention. And it's fascinating, right? Out of all the stuff that's going on, as soon as your name is mentioned, you turn to it. And the point is that is deeply embedded within you, your identity. Well, the way this works is, if you're able to successfully embed an intention, as an example, uh, let's say you were interested in getting a job in, uh, as an engineer in a particular company. Well, if you've embedded this correctly, what will happen is that your subconscious is always alert and attuned, even though you may not be. And let's say you're at a coffee shop and suddenly somebody's talking about, oh, I'm an engineer at this company. And suddenly you turn to them and then it suddenly gives you the ability to interact with that person. And people will call this synchronicity or coincidence. But in fact, you've attuned your subconscious to be attentive to circumstances around you that you would typically ignore. And what happens to all of us is there's so much data coming in that we ignore a large percentage of it. And I'm sure uh, many of the listeners, uh, they'll get in their car and drive to work and they don't even remember driving to work or mm -hmm. all the stuff that happened on the way to work because it's happening at an unconscious level. So you actually have this power to increase the likelihood of you manifesting. Now, I don't want people to get confused because it doesn't work like, well, uh, I want to walk on the moon, therefore I'm going to manifest it. It does not quite work that way. Uh, it has to be something that is reasonably realistic. And the other aspect is it doesn't work certainly 100% of the time, but there could be reasons why it doesn't work 100% of the times. One, uh, it may be that that actually is not the best path for you. Two, it may be not the right time. Three, uh, it may be interfering potentially with something else that's meant to happen. So I don't want to imply that this is 100%, but I what I do want to say is that more likely than not, utilizing these types of techniques or thinking processes will dramatically increase your ability to manifest your goals, your intentions, or what most matters. Jim, I'm really moved by this, not only because that was a lovely explanation, but also because I've realized in listening to you that the whole reason I'm here and we're here and Action of Happiness is here in some ways has one of these moments at its heart. So I um, was a pretty miserable, stressed man working in a corporate environment and then moved to work in environmental world and had developed a real sense of 
wanting to do something to contribute to creating a, a world that focused more on the authentic sources of happiness. And that had been embedded as a kind of intention. I'd love to do something to make that happen, but I had no idea what. And then there was an article by, you know, uh, an economic professor who I know you know, but um, at the time I'd heard of it, but didn't know personally, Richard Layard, writing in the in the Times about the need for a greater focus on happiness. And um, because of the intention I'd set myself in and put it in my subconscious, I my eye went to it and I read it and I got in touch with Richard and the rest is history. That was 2010. And then we launched Action for Happiness a year later. And and so that, that exactly as you've described it, the fact that it was kind of on my mind under the surface made me not only see this, but think I'm going to reach out. And then we we've created something from there together. So I'm sure there are many, many examples like that that have contributed to this community and to this the many people like like me and like you doing work in this area but i'm i'm really pleased that you've revealed that to me because i hadn't seen it that way before well you know and it's interesting because um uh, uh again most people are trying to manifest they just don't understand the keys to it and again i think so often they get confused by what they think they want versus what they need and I think that's a really important component of this. Mm, indeed. Let's just quickly turn to this idea of self-compassion, Jim, because one thing I've seen again and again in the actual happiness community is people who do have a deep, authentic desire to help others, very much manifesting in the way that you've laid this out of wanting to help contribute something of service and yet struggling in some cases, because of the nature of their work, you know, being a, a care worker, um, you know, a, a single parent, uh, you know, dealing with loved ones who are who are ill, working in in a teaching environment, all kinds of things that are, are quite high pressure ways of trying to help others. But also, many people who are sort of have a compassionate instinct and yet are very harsh on themselves. And I feel that we can only really authentically contribute to helping others if we're also at least able to be at peace with ourselves, not in a sort of narcissistic, loving myself all the time, I'm aren't I wonderful way, but more like, I'm I'm okay, I can accept myself, and then I'm better placed to help others. How do you see those things interrelate, compassion and self-compassion? No, I think uh, what you said is exactly correct. I, I think there are a couple aspects of this. One is that oftentimes, um, damaged or injured people feel a deep need within themselves to cure the world, if you will. And the problem with that, though, is that it's from the right place, but what it does is it ignores the pain that they're suffering. And they think that if I just put in more time, if I just do more for others, it will assuage the pain that I'm feeling. And uh, it just doesn't work. Uh, unfortunately, as we've seen among so many people, uh, this leads to burnout and uh, ultimately paralysis and inability to do your job. And of course, a variety of mental health issues. Of, and it's, uh, I hate to sound too simplistic, obviously, if you don't care for yourself and you're not able uh, then to help others, you're defeating your entire purpose. Uh, but the most important thing is one has to, again, have awareness of what is reasonable to expect from themselves. As you know, uh, many of our listeners uh, are more harsh to themselves than they would be to anyone else. And uh, again, I think in some ways, if you compare modern society to how we lived a few hundred years ago, or other, as an example, Eastern cultures, there is not this notion that I'm not good enough, I'm not worthy, I don't deserve love. And if you examine, as an example, the blue zones in the world, and these are places where people uh, grew up in these small villages, they were born there, they died there, they had a supportive community who knew them, they knew their good parts, their bad parts, and in the face of all of that, they still loved them. And that's really the key. 
you knew always that you were loved regardless of the good and the bad parts. And you accepted yourself that all of us are made up of good and bad parts and it's okay. You still deserve love. Unfortunately, in modern society where you don't have the support, if you will, of a village, oftentimes your parents or your siblings or others who you've grown up with or care about you are not available. And you're living in a modern society that uh, judges you. Uh, it's hard then uh, to not beat yourself up because you're always comparing yourself to others. And um, as a result, you create an internal narrative that has nothing to do with truth that says, well, I look at them and they're better than me. They live in a bigger house. They're doing better at their job. Uh, I shouldn't be in this job because I'm not really qualified. And as a result, this creates this chronic narrative in your head that is quite destructive. And the reality is, uh, it doesn't matter who you are. All of us deserve to be loved, cared for, held, hugged. Uh, and uh, look, I mean, there are parts about myself that I don't particularly like. <laughs> and uh, as you know, Carl Jung uh, came up with this idea of the shadow self. And the problem is so many of us try to push that shadow away, that part of us that we're, we hate about ourselves and separate it from us. The problem is that when you're stressed, when you're anxious, when you're weak, when you're hungry, the shadow self will come out and bite you. And what one has to do is make peace with the shadow self and say, it is part of me. And even though it is part of me and I strive to be my best self, I accept that it's part of me. And in the face of that, I'm still worthy of love. Mm, very well said. Thank you, Jim. I'm really glad you've reminded us of the shadow self and the, the fact that we're worthy of love. I think that's so profound. Let's just come back before we move to questions, because there's lots of great questions. And if you have a question for Jim, please do use the Q&A function and, and, and leave it there. And if you see another question you'd like to have answered, please give it a thumbs up and that will rise up the list. But just finally, um, on a practical note, Jim, I mean, what are some of the sort of brain hacks we could use or thinking practices we could use to manifest in our lives that, that we may not have talked about already? I mean, just a couple of things on my mind. I I um, was hosting one of our local action happiness groups near where I live last night, and we did a loving kindness meditation, which is a sort of cultivating a sense of love and compassion and then for loved ones and then moving it out to others. And that, I feel that really does shape how I then behave in my day. Another one is at the end of a day, I tend to do a reflection where I think what went well today? How was I helpful today? And then what could I do tomorrow, you know, based on what I've learned from today? So those are sort of things that I sometimes use. What, have you got any other examples of ways that we can sort of hack this into our, our subconscious, if you like? Well, as you know, Thich Nhat Hanh talks about a walking meditation, and it's the way to be present at all times. And it's a way to uh, be aware of what's going on around yourself versus being lost in uh, a future self that hasn't occurred yet, of which you have no control, mm. or ruminating about a past uh, with the I wish I had, which of course you also have no control. So I think uh, a mindfulness or meditation practice that allows you to be in the present moment and to see yourself as part of a whole and not separated. And that you're, who you are is connected to all that is outside of yourself. And for me personally, uh, my practice in some ways is like yours. I actually sit at the side of my bed every morning and do a breathing exercise. And I think of the joy and awe in this world. And then, uh, and it's, I mentioned this in my book, I do a um, reflection, if you will, on the alphabet of the heart, which is 10 letters of the alphabet, uh, C through L. And just to go over them quickly with you, one is uh, compassion for self and others, recognizing the dignity of every person, practicing equanimity, understanding 
that even the down times are transient, just like the up times, and trying to maintain an evenness of temperament without getting lost in the extremes, practicing forgiveness. And one very important one, which you mentioned, is having gratitude. Uh, then uh, humility. You know, so many of us oftentimes uh, get lost in the idea that somehow we're better than others. And if we actually understand that all of us are the same and uh, to be compassionate, you can't look above someone uh, that's pity. It has to be on eye to eye level that we're equal and uh, therefore we deserve to connect with the other person. Other is having integrity and values that bound your behavior. The other is this concept of justice or our responsibility to care for those who are vulnerable and they surround us. And of course, kindness has nothing to do with suffering, but all of this is bound by love. <clears throat> and so I go through that every day. And as you pointed out, uh, I, at the end of the day, reflect on what I am grateful for and think of how I can be of service to others as I go forward in my life. But I also try to reflect on what have I done for myself in the sense of how do I do self-care? And sometimes that can be exercise that's can, or it can be being in nature uh, or a whole variety of other activities that allow you to decompress, be nice to yourself and also accept love from those around you because that's hard for some people. And so many people reach out oftentimes and want to give us love and we just have to open up and accept it. Wow. I really, um, well, I, I love everything you said there, but particularly struck by that sequence of 10 letters. And I'm going to see if I can try and remember what you said. So from C to L, it was compassion, dignity, equanimity, forgiveness, gratitude, humility, integrity, justice, kindness, love. Did I get that? Amazing. Yeah. <laughs> Yes, you did. I cheated a little bit with some help from the community there as you were going along. But, um, <laughs> that's, a, that's a really powerful list of uh, attributes that we'd love to see more of in the world. Thank you for sharing that with us. I've actually never come across that before in, in that way. So thank you, Jim. Um, I'm also just reminded before we come to questions about something that I've heard you talk about before. And it's kind of core to this whole idea about our power to choose. And it's just being reminded of Viktor Frankl. And many people here will be familiar with his amazing book, Man's Search for Meaning. And it just, everything you said sort of reminds me about his idea that there's there's the stuff that happens to us, the stimulus, and there's what we do, the response, but there's a kind of space in between where we can kind of have more of a, a sense of choice than we perhaps realise we do. Um, that that's in fact the only thing that can't be taken from us, our ability to choose our own response in any circumstances. Is, do you think that's a really key to what we're talking about here today? No, I think uh, absolutely. And I appreciate you bringing that up. Uh, uh... People oftentimes, especially when they're particularly stressed, uh, uh, don't understand this reality. And uh, and we make assumptions about other people. Uh, uh, I tell a story uh, about a physician, a young physician I was working with, uh, and he and I were working on a project and we'd, we would meet every week. And he came to me one day and we started our conversation and he was extraordinarily aggressive, far beyond what I had ever seen him. And uh, I realized this was not normal for him. And I looked at him and I said, what's wrong? And he burst into tears. And the problem was that he had quit his prior job, was about to start a new job, but there was a period of time where he had chosen, and in the United States, you may not be aware, but you get your insurance from your employer and there's gap insurance, which you have to pay for. And he chose not to do that because he's young and he has two healthy ch children. But it turned out that right after he canceled, his wife noticed a lump in her breast. It was cancer. And he was terrified. And that was the driver behind his behavior. And 
again, our normal response when somebody is aggressive to us or angry is to uh, act in kind to them. Now, uh, I did not do that, obviously, and I was able to uh, help him get uh, retroactive COBRA insurance, and it turned out that she had a biopsy. It was cancer, but they were able to remove it. She didn't require any therapy. And so obviously he was quite grateful. But my point is we never know what's going on uh, with someone else. And when we take the time to reflect on this and understand, as I said, people carry baggage with them and it makes, uh, it has an impact oftentimes uh, on their behavior. And being thoughtful of that uh, is very, very important. And it could have a profound, profound effect on the others around you. It can indeed. Um, let's come to these questions. Lauren has asked uh, the most upvoted question. How do we find a balance between caring for others and not going to the extreme of burnout? Well, one, I think uh, in the activity that may cause burnout, you have to find a cadre of individuals who uh, create a support system for you. Uh, that's one. And you have to have clearly defined boundaries for yourself. Again, you know, when somebody says, well, can you take an extra shift after you've just worked 12 hours? You can say no. And it doesn't make you a bad person. And uh, in fact, it actually makes you a much more effective person because you don't lose all of your energy uh, trying to do something that is not right for you to do at that time. Sante's asked a fascinating question um, about a word you mentioned, I think just once earlier, about neuroplasticity. Um, she said, Professor, could you perhaps clarify how neuroplasticity affects our mind's ability to reshape our reality? Well, uh, just to mention a couple things, you know, when people use that term, oftentimes people will say, well, why can't I make my arm work after I've had a stroke? Uh, and there are parts of your brain that if you want to use the term uh, are malleable, are plastic, uh, that can be uh, affected by uh, different techniques. Uh, but there are other areas, uh, such as I just described, which you can potentially get some improvement, but oftentimes there is none uh, that's possible. But in regard to those areas that are plastic, if you will, uh, there is an immense amount of evidence uh, in the neuroscience literature, as an example, with uh, uh, meditation. It can have a huge impact on your amygdala and other brain structures, uh, as well as a compassion meditation. You can actually measure increases in sizes. Another interesting example is if you look at a person who is a violinist, as an example, a professional violinist, compared to the average person, uh, that part of their brain that is associated with hand movement is gigantic compared to other parts uh, uh, of the brain or the brain of somebody who is a novice or is not a violin player. So it demonstrates to you that what are the keys? Practice repetition uh, to uh, rewire your brain. And uh, there is a saying which is profound, which I can't remember, but it's neurons that act together, wire together, I think, or something along those I mean, lines. I think it's fire together when they fire yes, together. They together wire. They wire. <laughs> yes, exactly. So I think that's when we, cut, when we do these practices to cultivate compassion, we're making that more likely to happen in the future. Um, because of the sort of re gentle rewiring that happens. Um, thank you. Uh, Pav's asked a fascinating question. What are your thoughts on intuition or that feeling in our gut that we sometimes tend to ignore? Why did you have to ask that? Uh, well, uh, there actually now is a body of evidence that demonstrates that that feeling is actually real. It obviously comes from the brain. And it's like uh, the same thing when it says the first answer that pops into your head when you're taking a multiple choice test is to pick that, right? <laughs> Instead of think about it. And I think uh, there is a body of evidence that shows that intuition is real. And uh, uh, 
oftentimes you should listen to it. Mm. It's sort of our wise subconscious helping us remember the things that we want to to pay attention to in, in some ways. Um, I, I saw something in the chat earlier, which um, I can't remember the name of the person. I think it might have been Forrest, but just a really important point. It's very easy for us, I think, sometimes to talk about some of these lovely ideas around happiness and compassion and forget that for many people, life is a sort of a constant struggle. There are so many people dealing with real challenges around not only worries about their health or their loved one's health, but also just sort of providing for themselves and their loved ones in terms of the cost of living prices, the day to day. I remember what I think I saw in the chat was someone working in a, a pretty challenging environment and just struggling to cover their bills. And so how can we put into practice this manifesting idea with this compassionate intent and yet still cope with the situation where we're struggling to make ends meet? No, I think that's an excellent question. And unfortunately, as we see income inequality uh, uh, increase and we see what we would consider the social safety net for others, meaning a less compassionate world, uh, it is very hard. And uh, again, I'm not uh, implying some Pollyanna idea that you magically wish for something and it just happens and the world is a better place. For many people, the very nature of their situation is one which is extraordinarily difficult. That being said, I believe that, uh, you know, we mentioned hope a little bit earlier. Uh, we can do the best that we can uh, to manifest uh, a better world for our children, our loved ones. Uh, but again, uh, it's not 100%. And there can be, unfortunately, a ruthless part of the world that doesn't allow that to happen. And it's horribly unfortunate. But what I would say is that if all of our listeners recognize uh, that and be attuned to being of service to others, we can change uh, so many people's uh, lives from simple acts of kindness and compassion far beyond uh, what many of us uh, think we can. Jim, thank you. We're, we're out of time. In a moment, I'll come back to you for just one final thought. But uh, we have a, a sort of tradition with Action for Happiness gatherings to end with something we call a checkout. And that's got three parts to it. The first part is we're just going to all take a pause wherever you are in the world right now. Just take a moment to pause, take a breath and just notice how you're feeling, what's going on within you right now. And perhaps bring your attention to something you feel appreciative about of this time we've spent together. Maybe something you've learned from Jim, maybe something you've felt from the, the friendship and camaraderie in the chat, a new idea, uh, a new intention that you'd like to manifest in your life and in the world around you. And just holding that sense of appreciation. And then the final part is we are so privileged to be here to have this time together. And there are so many others around the world who are dealing with many issues, trying to work out how to live a good life and cope with difficult situations who maybe don't have the chance to join a session like this today to learn, to share, to be part of a community. So let's take a moment to send out some love and warm wishes to those others around the world who could do with more happiness, more compassion, more love, more of those things we've talked about right now. And as we hold those warm thoughts, just remembering that Action for Happiness pledged to create more happiness and less unhappiness in the world. Thank you all so much for being here. Thank you, Jim, for giving us your time and for all of your amazing work. We can't wait to see the book that's coming out soon. Is there a final thought you'd like to leave us with? Yeah, and in some ways it relates to exactly uh, what I was saying a little bit earlier. Never forget that each and every one of us, it doesn't matter our position, our status, our class, our wealth, have the ability to positively impact at least one person's life every day. And if you use that as your guiding star, you will be a happy person. Well, Jim, you've positively impacted lots of lives here in this time we spent together. We're very grateful to you. Keep up the inspiring work. And thank you, everyone, for being part of this. See you again soon. Thank Cheers. you, Mark.